or if familiar with all the voices here, if you're just coming in after we've started, uh, the person who's speaking uh, right now, this is Michael Healy, uh, and I'm sitting in Burlington, Vermont, uh, and co-presenting uh, with me is Marilyn. Marilyn, you want to speak so people hear you? Hi, everybody. This is Marilyn Scholl, and I'm in Putney, Vermont. All right. Um, and whoever's got a phone ringing in the background, um, you can uh, star six your phone uh, to mute. Uh, there's only a few people here who we're going to be hearing from today, uh, and so all of them should know that as an option. Uh, and then Mark Goring is coordinating all this for us. And Mark, you want to speak so people know your voice? Yeah, that was me, and that was my phone ringing. Sorry. That's well, then you know what to do in that case, huh? Um, so uh, Marilyn and I are have put together this workshop. We're going to try in just a, a very short time tell you everything you might ever want to know about. Um, perpetuating a strong board. And uh, one thing to point out from the very beginning is that the title of the workshop, as you all have seen it up until this moment, is Recruiting and Orienting New Directors. And as Marilyn and I put together the materials, we thought, you know, we'd really like from the very beginning to get folks to step back a little bit and think about this as a couple of the pieces of uh, board perpetuation of making sure the, the leadership team the, the, at the board level, the leadership team uh, continues on for a co-op long after any individuals who are currently there uh, remain. And so we're going to focus on, uh, and then I'll tell you how we're going to focus the, the agenda, but don't be scared that you're in the wrong meeting all of a sudden. Um, this, is, this is the right place to be. Um, this is part of the, the whole C-Build uh, series of workshops. Hopefully some of you have gotten the chance to sit in on a few of those. Um, today we're, we've got a few guests who are going to share some stories from their own co-ops. Um, and in a minute, uh, I'll get those folks to introduce themselves when we get to that point. Um, Mark has started to explain how you can uh, send questions to us. Uh, if you have a question, um, because the number of people on the call, um, it's easier, uh, more clear in terms of the, the oral, uh, in terms of people being able to hear, um, it's more clear if we do this in written form rather than uh, over the phone. So you can send in questions uh, to any of us at any time, and um, Mark will be monitoring them all the time. Mel and I will be monitoring them throughout. Um, Let's see. Marilyn, is there anything else that I should make sure folks hear in terms of the introduction? Well, I think you've done a good job, Michael. We're just really excited to have everybody here. Yeah, we do appreciate you coming out here in the middle of the day and uh, taking some time to learn something. Hopefully at the end of this you'll feel like it was worth your while and you'll have some, some things you can take back to your, uh, to your board. Um, so what I want to do is um, – there we go. Hey, Michael. If, hey. I could, if I could just jump in and, and just one last time give the instructions on how to provide a written comment. We're using uh -huh. the go to webinar toolbar and next to the question and answer line there you might have to hit the little triangle next to the letter Q to expand out the boxes and then you type something in, underneath enter a question for the staff and hit send. And feel free to just do that for fun and try it out and or if you have something that you would like to ask uh, Marilyn and Michael during the session. Thanks, uh, and thanks, Sarah, for, for giving that a try. Okay, all done, Michael. Hey, thanks. Um, so what we'd like to have happen here but between now and 2.30, uh, we're going to be done uh, by 2.30 at the very latest, is we'd like you all that are, that are uh, participating here to uh, go away understanding that having some sort of plan for perpetuation is where all this begins. And so we want boards uh, to be thinking ahead of how do we do this work and, and start making a plan for that. As you put together plans, we want you to have access to some tools, some ideas, some resources you can use uh, depending on where you are in your uh, board evolution um, that, w that we've put together a variety of tools that might uh, make sense for you, some things you can use as templates beginning places for your own thinking. We're going to share some of those with you. Um, the piece that we really want to focus on uh, a fair bit is this idea that um, in recruiting, we're going to try to get folks to think less about recruiting as uh, something you do once a year just for elections, but it's an ongoing work of 
developing and maintaining a pool of candidates. And Mel and I are going to share some ideas about how boards can go about doing that. Uh, and then once you do have such a pool, um, transitioning candidates into directors. Uh, how do we move from having a pool of people who are ready, willing, and able to serve on the board to folks who are actually doing that work? Uh, and then lastly, we're hoping you walk away from here uh, having a few more ideas about what it is that new directors might most want or need. Uh, so with that in mind, um, let's see, I've got to figure out how to change my slides here. Let me change my view. Here we go. Um, we're going to spend the first chunk of time uh, going over um, the recruitment part. Uh, given that uh, as we're talking to folks on different boards, that seems to be uh, a troubling part for many boards. Um, so we're going to spend mo most, the bulk of our time talking about recruitment. Uh, and then the, the second part of our workshop today, we're going to focus on some of these other aspects that after recruiting, how do you go through the screening and nominating process? Um, how we might think about elections and appointments, and how we might uh, go about orienting new directors. So with all that in mind, um, we're going to start with recruitment. Uh, and uh, what we're, what we're going to begin with is, is our, our dear friend Uncle Sam here, or whoever the good uncle is on your co-op board, uh, reaching out and letting folks know in your co-op that uh, they are wanted, that we do want people to serve our co-ops. One way to serve is on the board. Um, what we have is uh, some ideas to think about. Uh, if the board is out there trying to uh, perpetuate itself, um, well, we start with understanding that the board does have a certain responsibility. Um, representing the member owners, well, that's why a board exists to begin with. Governing, once, once we're there as representatives, what is it that we're doing while we're governing um, the cooperative? Uh, what we're trying to encourage boards to do is to really look outward rather than into the operations that most of our co-ops um, uh, that are still existing today have gotten to the place where we've hired professional uh, management and staff to take care of the internal operations and that the board can the co-op. And in, in terms of governing, if we're uh, encouraging a diversity of viewpoints, really looking at uh, leadership st strategically, um, and uh, really looking towards the future rather than past or present, then that's what the board is there to do on behalf of those member owners. Um, one of the responsibilities is to make sure that can continue, that both the representation and the good governance. And so it's not just what we're doing here today, but that we're always building for this uh, ability into the future. Um, in, in thinking about recruitment, it helps to start first thinking about what do we want from directors. Now in uh, the book Boards That Make a Difference, John Carver in talking about policy governance um, talks about what might make effective directors. And rather than thinking about directors having certain attributes or certain, uh, I should say, professional skills, um, rather than thinking about do we want a director who's a lawyer or an accountant or uh, a grocery manager or um, a fundraiser or any of those other kinds of skills, I uh, think about boards, if we're going back to that boards are there as representative of the member owners and are there to govern uh, in these far-reaching ways, then maybe we can think about directors um, who are first dedicated to the cooperative, uh, second who are able to think in terms of system and context, who are themselves honest, uh, who, are, who are good judges, good, have good character, um, who are able to deal with some of these big topics, the big ideas that boards grapple with. We want folks who can uh, participate in discussions, who can really put out their own perspective but are also able to then, once the board makes a decision, um, even if it wasn't their opinion to start with, they can, they can abide by the board decision. That's a, a careful balance that good directors, uh, ha all, all of us have trouble in accomplishing. Um, 
and once the board has made a decision, can can each of us delegate power? Are we willing to say we've done our part by making the decision, and then now we can delegate the responsibility for carrying that out to someone else? Uh, in our case, typically it's the professional manager or management team of our co-op. So if we're if we're thinking about these as the characteristics of effective directors, then how do we go about finding those directors? Um, now you all on your board might have a, a list that looks a little different than this, um, but it does help to start off as a whole board saying, who is it that we're looking for? What is it we're trying to find uh, in our in our directors? And then here is the the the. Uh, the key, as, as Marilyn and I were talking about this, what we're finding is that the, the difficult part is that oftentimes boards are looking at recruitment um, sort of in a, in a not, not quite crisis mode, but we look at it as a one-time deal. Okay, we need to recruit somebody to run for election this year. We need to recruit somebody to fill this vacancy. Uh, but if, if we can step back from that a little bit and say that what a board really could use is a, a whole bunch of people who we know are um, who have those characteristics that we're looking for and who might be willing and ready to step in when we need them. And so if we're doing this, um, of the pool of candidates we create out of that pool, maybe only a few will stand for election this year, or maybe only one of those people will be appointed this year, but there's still that larger uh, group of candidates who we can look to to fill those vacancies. So this is not a one-time deal. Um, if you go back to uh, the board's work, then if you as a board have uh, expressed the desired qualities, um, that's what we I was just talking about in the last slide, um, as a whole board also, what is it that we want to um, say together about the screening process about candidates, uh, for candidates? Uh, and lastly, um, what, what do we want to say together as a board about the nomination process? These are some high-level, board-level decisions. And then um, you can delegate a lot of the work, uh, and we'll talk about how boards might do that, um, who will then figure out the exact procedures and plans uh, for carrying out the work. Uh, and we aren't going to get into a lot of the specifics, um, knowing that these can vary from co-op to co-op and year to year, uh, but just knowing that that's your uh, your work at the board is to articulate the high-level values. What kind of people are we looking for, and what's the process we're going to use uh, in, a, in a general way about for screening and nominating? Um, one of the things that we're going to try to do today is hear some stories from folks who have been doing this work in, in either some effective ways or some interesting ways, and. Um, we wanted to uh, have a chance to, to hear from uh, four different speakers. Uh, it turned out uh, at the last minute uh, we were going to have someone from Weaver's Way who's not going to be with us today, but I did want to share part of their story. Um, but uh, Leslie, are you there? I am. Leslie, uh, is, maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, the co-op you're from and the, the sort of the short story of, of what might be interesting about your co-op. And then maybe um, tell us a story or two about some things you all have done uh, for recruitment that you found were interesting or effective or that you think other folks might enjoy trying. Okay. Well, my name is Leslie Watson, and I'm the board president for the Eastside Food Co-op. Um, we are um, one of the newest cooperatives in the cooperative stronghold of the Twin Cities. Um, we're located in northeast Minneapolis, and we opened four and a half years ago. We're at 2,500 members. Um, we're in a um, pretty... Uh, a neighborhood of um, pretty mixed demographics, a lot of ethnic diversity, and um, and for us, recruitment has um, been quite successful. Um, I don't know how much of that we might attribute to the fact that we're new, but it's you know an incredibly exciting time um, for our co-op. But our board has certainly both. I've been on the board since before we opened, and we've had times where we've had to really actively work to recruit board members, and um, I think there's a couple different things that have been quite successful for us. The first is I think that the community really perceives and believes that we are mission-driven, that our um, that we really walk our talk of building community and getting involved in this community, and people believe that and feel both welcome in our store and welcome in the, in the kind of democratic process. We don't actually have a nomination process. It's um, more informal than that. 
something we may need to look at, but we don't have that now. So we invite people to step forward, and if they want to run, we, we just encourage that and, and welcome them into our board meetings and give them the information they need to make the decision themselves. Um, a couple different things that we've done that um, have been particularly successful um, have involved um, a direct board presence in the store on um, what we, we have these uh, periodic members days. We've set up tables right in the lobby of the store and essentially accosted people as they walked in the door and asked them if they have any interest in running. And um, we're small enough that we know a lot of the shoppers or our GM knows a lot of our shoppers, so we see a lot of friends coming in the door and um, people who have been involved for a long time. So those conversations are easy. Um, to have very often, but so often we've gotten totally new people um, who've been interested and, and sat down and had a conversation with us. We put together a couple of years ago as part of our recruitment a board book where each of us on the board wrote our own story and our own words about why we wanted to be on the board and what value it brought to us personally and, 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 and to the co-op and put that together as part of recruitment materials. And it was a great exercise. I don't know how much that influenced anyone's decision. It was a great exercise for the board, and we've used it in other contexts and other ways since then. Um, I would say that um, when we have invited people and when they've come, uh, in this last round, for instance, we had nine people interested. We have five, um, five spots open this year with four incumbents are running, and then we have nine people who expressed initial interest and four are with us still in this process of exploring um, board service. We've invited them to meetings and been very, very conscious of being welcoming and, and inviting them to have a place at the table and a conversation, to join our conversations and to really, um, I think it's part of our culture to be that open and to just really um, um, give a clear sense um, that this is a board that works together in a very harmonious and very uh, constructive way. It's very open. So uh, I think those are my thoughts about what Eastside Food Co-op has been up to with respect to recruitment. That's great. Thank you, Leslie. I wanted to um, just emphasize the part that when I first started hearing about the Eastside story, the part that really struck me was that exercise of the board articulating what it was that inspired them to do the work they're doing. Um, I've seen a lot of board recruitment materials from different co-ops where folks do a really good job saying, here are the, the, um, you know, here are the responsibilities, this many meetings, this many hours of work a week or a month, um, and here's the, the compensation, whatever it might be. Um, but it's a little bit uh, rarer to have um, some material where the, where the board members have said, look, this is why this work is exciting. This is what really moves me about this work. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more later, but I want to make sure folks didn't miss that part of what you were just saying, Leslie. Um, I also want to give a chance to um, Linda, and I can't tell, is Amy here with us? Yes, I am. Amy, hi. Um, I know that uh, each of you I wanted to have speak um, specifically a little bit later on uh, on part of the um, post-recruitment um, efforts, uh, but I wondered if you had anything right now uh, also about something your board does in terms of recruitment that you wanted to add to what Leslie was saying. So maybe first, uh, Amy, and then Linda, if you have something. Well, we haven't been, it sounds like, nearly as successful as Eastside in recruitment, although we were very happy this time that we had um, four candidates for two open positions, and they were all very good candidates. And um, so I, I, I should preface that by saying I'm from the community of Mercantile. We um, are in Lawrence, Kansas, a community of about 90 to 100,000 people. It's a college town, so about, about 25,000 of those are college students. Um, and our membership is about, oh, close to 4,000 now. Um, um, but so ultimately it's still a pretty small town for the people that are not college students. And so we all know quite a few people too. Um, and although interestingly we only had, we ha of these four candidates, the only person that we knew that was running was an incumbent. Um, but they were four very good candidates. and. Um, we really just uh, do articles in the newsletter, and, and we do talk to a lot of people, and we, we call people that may be interested, and um, people are very busy, and it's hard to, you know, as much as they like the co-op, they want to they wanna shop there, and they don't really want to be on the, um, on the board. The people that did run this time uh, were all new to the community, and part of what interested them was getting involved in this 
sort of really um, uh, stable part of the Lawrence community. Um, so I think that's something that we want to highlight the next, you know, in our future board recruiting. Which part did you want to highlight? Um, the, the fact that uh, the community mercantile is really sort of a mainstay of the Lawrence community. Uh -huh. And um, it, it is really a good way to get involved and to meet people and to be involved in something that a lot of people believe in, whether they have time for it or not. Good. So I think that's also an important piece is the, uh, adding to uh, the idea that we can tell folks the story about why this is a mainstay, why this is a critical part of the community, but also recognize that board work, most people are, who are involved in the co-op are not going to be involved at the board level, but there are a few people who might have time, availability, interest, and the skills that we're looking for. And so it's that active process of always out there casting the wide net to see who might be available, uh, interested at any given time. Um, thank you for that. Um, Linda, did you have anything quickly you wanted to add in terms of things that Weaver Street might have done? Uh, maybe you could quickly tell about Weaver Street and then anything you all might have done in terms of uh, recruitment. Okay, uh, I'm uh, Linda Steer, and I'm on the board of Weaver Street Market, which is uh, the main store is located in Carborough, North Carolina, uh, which is just due west of Chapel Hill. Um, and uh, Weaver Street, the main store, is in the core of the Carborough community, uh, currently celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. And we also have um, stores in Southern Village, which is just south of Chapel Hill, and then newly opened, but, but for a few weeks, is the Hillsborough store, which is about um, uh, 25, 25 miles west of Carborough. And um, we also have Panzanoa, which is a, a restaurant associated with the market in downtown Carborough. Um, membership well over 10,000, and, uh, you know, everything – it's a whole metro area of a, that tips about a million people, and yet very small communities. So Weber Street Market being a hub, there's people who know each other, which is what are, has already been mentioned. Um, the thing that I would say that we are challenged by is that we basically have three different kind of recruitments. We have six rotating board positions. Two are appointed by the board. So there's the recruitment that we do for those appointments. There are two consumer owner positions which we recruit for and then two worker owner positions and the one worker owner and the one consumer owner and one appointed change over every year. Um, so it's an interesting mix that we have a slightly different focus on each but focusing on the consumer owner I think much has been said about people really wanting to contribute that it's a hub in Carborough and we notice that there are more uh, opportunities for recruitment when there is, um, the, you know, the hot issue um, in the recent move to Hillsboro has been um, something that owners have taken notice of and uh, people are more engaged and involved in thinking about uh, wanting to be of service and provide. So I find that big events um, naturally that might occur in a cooperative actually engender more interest and, um, you know, one, one thought is actually creating what's the topic of interest that might engage owners that would encourage people to want to participate. All right, so trying to find the, 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 uh, the ideas, the issues that might engage people. Right. Um, and I think it's also important for us to remember, like, as Linda starts telling the story about what they do at their co-op, it's very distinct, but the needs of their board based on the, the ownership model of Weaver Street. Um, so the things that they do there at Weaver Street might not translate exactly to what any other club does. So one of the things we want you all to leave today with is realizing that we aren't trying to tell you there's one magic way or that you should do exactly what another club board has done. We're just looking for a, a, a variety of ideas here that you might find something that does click for you all. Um, that the point is not to just to copy what someone else is doing. Um, I think I'm going to hold off for a minute on the, on uh, some of the ideas that I heard from Weaver's Way that I wanted to share with you just so we can keep moving on. Hey, Michael. Um, with our, hey, Mark, yes. Could I just jump in and, and um, with uh, a couple quick comments? Linda, um, thanks for your for your comments. And when you, uh, when you speak again, if you could have a little more volume, that would be helpful. Some people had a hard time hearing. And then I do have a couple of comments from participants, uh, Michael, so whenever you're ready, uh, let me know. Yeah, go right ahead. Well, there's uh, it, it might be one one uh, uh, thread, 
which is on this idea of uh, you know quote unquote screening candidates. So there's uh, one participant wrote in that they that the board has reserved the right to screen candidates, which the whole board has has uh, majority of the board has stridently defended, but some members think is uh, is, is 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 inappropriate. And um, uh, so it's this kind of question of how do you promote a democratic process. Uh, have qualified candidates and somehow have a filtering process that might allow for that to happen. And then kind of along the same line, another person wrote in that said, although our co-op mission statement is not about the quote unquote, the food, it seems our board is almost entirely comprised of people who might be described as quote, the food police with a sympathetic ear toward any core member with similar views. Can you comment on how to diversify this type of board composition, or is it not a problem? Oh, well, let me quickly just the first kind of question, because we are going to, a little bit later in, the, in this presentation, talk about screening and how to do it well, appropriately, and why it's important. Um, the second one, I wonder, Marilyn, if you might uh, think of a way to respond to that. I'm not sure off the top of my head if I have a, a great answer for that. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. I think in um in the earlier part of the presentation, Mike, Michael talked about uh, looking for directors and the characteristics of directors. And one of those is commitment to the members and to the mission. And so it, it really is important to find people who are not wanting to serve on the board only to represent their own interests, but are inspired by the diverse interests of the co-op's members. Um, Amy mentioned that their co-op has over 4,000 members, and you can imagine that there are probably um, a number of different perspectives on the ideal co-op amongst those 4,000, maybe as many as 4,000 different ideas. And so the board can't possibly be made up of 4,000 people. It wouldn't be at all practical. Um, but how does a board... Uh, find people who are interested in exploring that diversity and who aren't on just to further their own missions and their own perspective, but who want to and are eager to try to understand what are the broad perspectives, how do we, how do we balance the broad perspectives of the diverse group of members and, uh, who are, uh, and looking for folks who are challenged by that kind of thinking uh, rather than, than uh, their own soapboxes. Okay, so I might take that um, just as a segue into our next uh, slide, looking at a process that many co-op boards use, and that is to design a board development committee, a uh, committee that has is a standing committee that works under the board's guidance, as of course all committees do, and have responsibilities for planning and overseeing the recruitment, screening, and election process, as well as orientation, training and development, and board evaluation. Now, each board can decide for itself the best way that you want to, to organize and do your work. Now, this is just something that we see fairly commonly, that there is a board development committee. Sometimes there's a subcommittee that's focused on just the recruitment and nomination process. Uh, that way, directors who are up for re-election and so would have a conflict of interest in serving on the uh, recruitment and, and election part of the work uh, can still participate in the broader board development committee. Uh, so this is just, just one tool. Uh, in, our, in our toolbox at the end, we do have a sample charter for a nomination and, and recruitment committee. If your co-op decides that you want to have either a, 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 a committee or a subcommittee, who's responsible for that work. Um, moving to the next slide, though, we do want to emphasize that recruitment is an activity that's year-round and for all the board. So having a committee is not meant to, to take away the responsibility that the whole board and all the directors have for participating in the, in the recruitment process, in the building the pool of candidates. It's just that it's useful to have a committee who helps the board uh, focus on that issue. So it still is year-round effort, and everyone has a role. 
part of the reason that we approach this as the responsibility is to build a pool of candidates is so when it comes time to begin the actual election and nomination process, you already have a broad pool of candidates in that in that group, and so you can focus on uh, working with and, and getting to know better the, the folks from that list that are most interested or seem most promising. Uh, if you're trying at that at the same time you're needing to move into the into the screening and selection process that you're developing your pool at that time, you uh, often can find that your timeline is very uh, scrunched and you don't take as much time as you might want to in really talking with people who are interested in, in finding out more about them and helping them find out more about the co-op just to see if it's going to be a good fit. Next thing that we wanted to emphasize in this building a pool of candidates is that it's an active process. We in our work have informally polled uh, lots and lots of directors to find out how they got uh, recruited to their board, how they decided to stand for election or appointment to a board. And in asking that question, we find a very high percentage of directors who say they decided to run for the board because someone asked them personally to do so. And a much smaller percentage of people who say they decided to stand for the board because they saw a sign in the store or a notice in the newsletter. So while we do think that you should do those things, you should put a sign in the store, you should put articles in the newsletter, you should um, scan widely and invite people who are interested to step forward, we don't think that that alone will generate uh, the kind of pool of candidates that we think that you need to draw from on an annual basis for both the elections and possible appointments. So we suggest that it's an everybody, year-round, active process. Next recruitment is about communication. There's um, a, a lot of things that, that uh, some of the, the representatives from different uh, food co-ops that were speaking earlier were talking about making sure that their board is doing work that's meaningful, and then telling the story of that work. Uh, Leslie talked about having a, a book where each director talked about their own personal experience and why it was rewarding, what they got out of, of, of serving on the board and how it was inspirational and meaningful work. And we think that that is an important part of it, is to make sure that your board is doing interesting work, that it is a, attractive to um, people who, who want to get engaged in meaningful and, and enriching work. And then make sure you tell that story about that work, that the board is visible in not only who the board is, but the kind of work that you're doing. Um, letting the members, potential candidates, uh, all, all kinds of, of people that you might interact with know what the opportunities are and what kind of work you're doing. So in addition to some other fairly fundamental things like making sure people who are interested know what, what the board's roles and responsibilities are, what kind of qualities you're looking for, what kind of expectations there are, and what the process is, um, we really think the, the lead on it is, is doing inspiring work and telling that story. The next part of communication that we wanted to emphasize today is uh, encouraging people who might be interested to learn more. So the first kind of contact that you have with people is not forcing them into a decision of yes, they want to run for the board or no, they don't, but simply that they're interested and they might like to, to know more about what's going on. But just giving uh, folks opportunities to find out more more about what the board does, more about when the board meets, who's on the board, uh, that sort of thing, builds the, the communication and uh, helps people see again if it's a good fit and something they might be interested in. Uh, this is also a place where I might refer back to the question we talked about earlier of just uh, looking for people that have a diverse uh, perspective on, on what the co-op is, 
what, what the possibilities are for the co-op so that you can have um, rich and invigorating discussions around the boardroom with, with different perspectives, um, hopefully representing a kind of perspective that you have amongst your membership. But even if you don't have a lot of different perspectives on the board, it's useful in discussion to bring in as many diverse perspectives as you can by imagining those perspectives, having invited guests, uh, role playing. Um, there are different ways to do that. Uh, but recruitment is a good place to get a, um, as diverse a pool and as deep a pool as you can for potential candidates. I want to speak a little bit about how to find candidates. Um, one of the methods is members who are already involved in the co-op. Some of that is in high volume or frequent shoppers, that they're involved heavily as shoppers in the co-op. But there's also possibilities of looking for people who have been involved in other kinds of activities that the co-op has, has uh, engaged in, maybe uh, members who have come to annual meetings, uh, members who have worked on uh, special projects or in, on forums or different kinds of um, uh, events that you might have to to discuss things with members. Um, I, one of the things that uh, the Weaver's Way Co-op did is uh, establish some member forums over a period of time and invited uh, specific uh, members to come to those forums and uh, engaged as a member linkage and engagement tool. But one of the side benefits of that tool, and in fact they hoped it would be a side benefit, was that those members became more interested in what the work of the board was. So very often your member linkage activities can uncover members who might be interested in uh, being more involved in the co-op. Another idea is asking the staff, uh, the general manager and other managers, who they think might be good directors. Um, the main reason for that is that they uh, often see the members more frequently and know a broader swath of who the members are um, because they're in the store and uh, interact with a, a larger number of, of people who are members and shoppers. So they often have good suggestions. Um, the next list is, is just looking at, at members who are uh, personal and professional contacts that the current directors have. Um, Looking at organizations in your community that maybe have similar values to the co-op. Uh, maybe uh, there's other organizations that are committed to uh, the local economy or uh, development of, of community-based enterprises, community, maybe organizations that are involved with food issues or agriculture may have folks who are either uh, employed by staff folks or, or volunteers or directors at those organizations. Also members of the co-op be a uh, set of people to interest and invite. Uh, community leaders of uh, Amy said it before, a lot of people are, are really busy and involved and and they may not be able to have, to have time, find time to serve on the co-op board. But we suggest that you not be afraid of approaching them. Just because are perceived, are perceived to be busy doesn't mean you shouldn't ask them. Ask them anyway. Maybe they'd like to be on a list for a future year if they can't do it now. But we do find that, that busy people make good directors. Um, sometimes uh, if people have too much time on their hands, they're, they're, they're able to engage in in more uh, trivia and small issues and inefficient operations that directors who are busy can come to resent. So don't be afraid of asking busy people. Of course, you may uh, you may strike out on some of those, but but do ask. And then our last suggestion is that everybody that you come in contact with and everybody that you ask about board service, uh, if they're interested in being in the pool, even if they say no. Ask them for referrals. Now, this is the best way to get out of the pool of people that you already know, people who already think like you or who travel in the same circles as, as the current directors. Amy talked about this in, uh, in talking about the, the four candidates that ran for the Merck board this year, that the current board didn't, didn't know the, those people until they got involved in the recruitment and screening process. And I think that's a really healthy sign that you're getting um, 
uh, seeking and developing diverse perspectives. And uh, one way to, to keep rippling out into the next circle of people, of contacts, is to always be asking for referrals and suggestions from everyone you come in contact with. Um, on the next slide, uh, we're just talking about the first step in contacting those potential candidates. And remember what we said before, that what we're really looking for at this stage is developing a pool of candidates. So we're not asking uh, uh, people at this point to make a decision about whether or not they would be willing to serve or, or stand for election, uh, but just if they're interested in learning more. So your first contact, uh, your first question is to ask if you can send a packet with more information, uh, if they'd be interested in, uh, in learning more and finding out more. Uh, then if, if so, you mail those packets and then, then follow up with a phone call to answer their questions and to ask if they're interested in, in continuing that process. So remember, you're recruiting candidates, not directors. You do need to make it clear that it is an election process or a selection process if it's an appointment, and that the, uh, it, it's, there's no guarantees that everyone who enters it will be successful. One thing that, that human resource people uh, have learned and, and recommend is that if you're interested in high quality applicants, you, you uh, make it clear that you're seeking, you're seeking and accepting applications that a, a sign posted that says now hiring doesn't uh, generate as high of quality applicants as one that says now accepting applications. We don't really know if that translates to recruiting directors, but the idea is to make it clear that it, that it is a selection process, that it is an important and challenging job, and that it's an honor to serve on the board of directors. The board does good and inspiring work. And you're looking for people who want to participate um, in that process and are willing to, to put themselves up for the, the selection process. So in that process, what if they don't say yes? What if people say no? Um, first thing is to ask them if they would be willing to, um, to be added to the list of potential candidates. You might want to go to the next slide, Michael. The next thing would be, uh, I'm sorry, the first thing would be to ask them if they can suggest other people, then to say if they might be willing to stay in the pool. So, okay, you're not interested this year, that's fine, but would it be okay if we, if we called you again next year uh, or if we have a midterm opening or, or maybe a few years hence? Would you be interested at, at any point in the future? so that you can keep uh, keep them in the pool. Hey, Marilyn, just hold one sec. Michael, I think we're, uh, my slide didn't advance, so could you try that again? Is Michael Healy in the room? Oh, no, did we lose Michael? Okay. Uh, I can, uh, one moment, please. I'll ask you a question while I get that uh, get it going here, Marilyn. Um, how would a board know who the high volume or frequent shoppers um, might be? The, the co-op's point of sale system uh, is probably able to generate a, a list like that. You know, ask your manager about that. If the co-op doesn't have a point of sale system that can generate that, chances are the manager and the staff would also be aware of who those people are. I grab the controls here, and we'll just get our. Um, take one. I think we're on page fifteen, Mark. Thank you. That one? No. That one. Oh, that'll take a second. Uh, the one. 
There we go. How's that? That's it. There we go. Okay. What if, what if they don't say yes? So we've divided this into two categories. What if they say no? And then if they say maybe. Um, in the what if they say no category is uh, once again asking them to suggest others to see if they'd be willing to leave their name for future years. And finally ask them if they would be willing to participate in the election process. Would they uh, help make sure that the board has a good, uh, is a good board and, and good candidates are elected by reading the candidate statements, coming to forums, and voting in the election. If they say maybe, um, keep engaged in the conversation. Uh, find out what it is that causes them to say maybe. Uh, what are their concerns or what are their issues? And how might you be able uh, to address those concerns? If they say maybe, it might be a good time to invite them to attend a board meeting uh, to see if, if that would help them see if it's a good fit for them or not. And also be sure that they understand this isn't the last step in the process, that uh, there, will be, there will still be screening, um, nominations, and elections. So um, they may be able to stay in the process even uh, for the time being, even if they're not sure yet. So that's the variety of things we wanted to say about developing this broad pool of candidates. Um, and so we are, are very happy to take any questions now or, or any, uh, any questions for Michael or I or, or any of the other presenters, Linda or Leslie or Amy. And I have one um, uh, here. Let's see, how do we respond to the charge made by a fellow board member of mine that using data like high shoppers or member loan participants to recruit will slant the board towards wealthy candidates? What we're trying to do in, in this part of the, of the workshop is to suggest that it's very useful to have a broad pool of potential candidates. So this isn't a selection process. Uh, this is trying to identify uh, who all would be able to be considered as a candidate. And so there are other steps, other screening and nomination steps. Um, so this isn't the final process. Um, but I think the, the point of the co-op is to serve its members' needs. And so the high volume shoppers are those that are, that are finding a high level of their needs that are being met by the co-op. So there, that might be a perspective that would be useful. So it's, it's not the only thing on the list of what to look for. It was one of a dozen or so. Um, so we're just, we are just trying to encourage you to develop a deep and wide pool of potential candidates. And Marilyn, to follow up on that, uh, the question is, how do you handle a candidate that's very interested but the board does not find acceptable for one reason or another? Well, um, the next part of our workshop is going to be about the screening process. And so we do think that that's a relevant question, just one that I'd prefer to, to handle when we're in that section of the webinar. At this point, we are still really talking about how can you have a, a deep, wide, and rich pool of possible candidates uh, so that when you're going through the selection process, you have a, a lot of folks who are interested and, and ready to serve. Mm -hmm. um, are there any ideas for recruiting minority candidates? I think all of the same ones are, are really useful, just looking for um, f folks that are starting with your membership base and uh, looking for, for people who have the kind of qualities that you're looking for. I don't think there's any, any particular or, or special methods. You're, you're, again, you're looking for a deep pool, a wide pool of candidates, so of course you would want um, as many people in that pool as you could get. And just a reminder to folks, if you want to send in a question any uh, uh, during the session, use the GoToWebinar input written interface thing there. Marilyn, that's the one, one director did write in that when they were doing their member loan campaign, they wished they'd had more board members capable of making loans. <laughs> 
Thanks for that, Chris. And that's all I have in the queue. Okay. Uh, let me just see if uh, any of the other participants, Linda or Leslie or, or Amy, would like to add anything just at this point about developing a pool of candidates. Um, well, I can speak just a little bit to the concern about um, using data from the point of sale system. Just to say that for us, um, we did look we had looked at that for both um, both when we started a, a member investment campaign and also for recruitment. And we were very interested to find out that actually many of our investors are not in the top tier of shoppers, and that we just figured that maybe the top tier of shoppers are, you know, spending a lot of their money at the co-op and can't invest. And so I guess what was revealed to us is that our assumptions about that were wrong. So. Um, I mean, it just underscores kind of what Marilyn said about people who are really shopping a lot are invested, um, you know, in, in in the store and in in different ways, and and it may not necessarily be a, a matter of excluding people on the basis of wealth. So that was a lesson we learned. Thanks, Leslie. Anything else from Linda about developing a, a big pool? No, um, I think you covered it well. So at one point you had some um, member dinners that you were that you were using as a member linkage strategy, and you had some candidates from that. Could you speak to that a little bit, Linda? I can, and I want to check. Um, Mark, is my volume? Can people hear me? I think you're okay, Linda. I'm okay. Yep. I'll speak up a bit. Um, well, one of our member linkage activities one year, we we are in a um, university town. Uh, well next to a university and uh, kind of a highly highly tech region. Um, so really just putting a sign up, we wanted to um, create an opportunity to link with people when we had revised our ends and giving them an opportunity to say, here's what we created, what's your feedback on it. And we had wanted to create two different set of gatherings, one regarding that and then another one purely operational type questions. Um, and posted, just announced that with a posting, you know, if you're interested in coming to hear about these things, it's going to be a free dinner and, you know, put your email down. And it was amazing how many people, you know, where we got emails from. And then it was just uh, an announcement going out to people and they came. You know, I think over the course of six months or so, we had a thousand people come through to either one of those and it was really an op and there were some people who were then interested in the board but it wasn't a specific board recruitment but I could see in the future of having that opportunity again and perhaps having the format of it include the kind of opportunities that if people were interested in participating in different ways whether to um, provide further input or serve on task force or, or if they were interested in board membership that there would be just a, a, a willing audience to hear how else to participate because they were definitely interested. They were interested in what the co-op was doing. Um, so it became like a ready pool to develop a ready pool. Um, so that did work really well. Thanks a lot, Linda. Uh, Mark, any more questions on this section before we move on to moving from a pool of candidates to effective directors? No. Okay, well then let's look at the next slide. Hey, Marilyn. Hey, hey, Michael. Michael. Michael, welcome back. Hey, uh, I don't know what happened. I don't actually have the uh, screen yet, so hopefully you're able to do that for us, Mark. Yeah, I'm we're just... running that. We're on to uh, Mr. Einstein. All right, so continue on for a second, Marilyn. Back into gear here, okay? Okay, you bet. Um, actually, just what I was uh, going to do is um, uh, from from Mr. Einstein here, we have a selection plus training, and I wanted to invite Amy to to talk about the Community Mercantile Board. Uh, they've just this year decided to to emphasize the screening process, and I just wondered, Amy, if you would talk a little bit about uh, why and how you went about that. Uh, sure. Well, I think um, I was I was a sort of an instigator in the screening with you know after it was suggested because we had had some serious problems with um, board members who came on with an agenda and really sort of derailed our whole process. Um, so 
you know, we found we, we were we got a director who wanted to just sit back and listen for a year before he ever participated. We had another who who really came on with some. He, he wanted to be uh, really involved in the food selection process in the product mix. Um, and we had another director who, who didn't come very often. And then when she came, um, she wanted to talk operations quite a bit. And um, it really slowed us down. And, you know, we've got a board full of busy people. And it, we were not making any progress on our goals. So uh, we decided to, to implement the screening. And there was a lot of question about whether we should be doing it or not, whether we were becoming too exclusive. You know, there's there's always been this um, slight perception of exclusiveness um, within the co-op anyway. Um, so we didn't want to encourage that. We've sort of been getting away from that in recent years. So what we decided was that, you know, once we accepted nominations, we would interview each candidate uh, with exactly the same set of questions, and we would have as many board members there as possible. Um, and um, the goal was not necessarily um, to make sure that we had people that were on board with policy governance, although obviously we wanted that, but they didn't necessarily have to know a lot about policy governance or um, already, you know, be set to be very knowledgeable board members, but we wanted to see how they communicated with us, um, if it looked like they were coming with a particular agenda in mind that, that was going to, you know, drive their their membership on the board, whatever. And so we, we had these actually fairly innocuous questions, but, but they were pretty open-ended and it really got us gave us a chance to think about the people and how they would, how they would interact with us. And so of the four um, nominees, we decided to go ahead and endorse all four of them. And we definitely had our favorites among those four, but there was nothing to, um, to say that, that, the other two, that the others would not have made good candidates as well. Um, I'm not sure what it would have been like if we had had one of those um, previous difficult members in the process. And um, if they would have made it past the screening process, I just don't, you know, I'm not sure. This was our first year of doing it. Um, and it was successful this year. Uh, I, I think that we can fine tune it in the future. But um, I'm really happy that we did it. And people are, and since we endorsed everybody this year, I think that we're sort of getting people used to the idea that this is going to be done. Um, and uh, I don't think that we, well, we didn't annoy anybody this year, luckily. Good. Thank you so much, Amy. Sure. Any of the other, um, uh, Leslie or, or Linda, would you like to, to share anything on this um, uh, moving from candidates to directors process? Well, this is Linda. and. Uh, we have had, in the course of our history, um, board members with agendas. So um, it's been something that's been on the mind of the board, uh, even be and it occurred prior to when we adopted policy governance. But it's you know it's kind of institutionalized that we know the downside of what that does for a board, and so there's um, kind of there's but there's been an ongoing concern about and, and tendency to want to do some kind of selection process. And at, um, a few years ago, we did, you know, we sat down and we looked at the whole spectrum because there's the balance between wanting to select, having a, do we endorse a slate of candidates, do we screen in some way to the whole opposite end of the scale of the pure transparency and really leaving it in the hands of the owners to choose fully without any board intervention whatsoever. And what we've come to um, is not not a formal screening, on the, and this has to do with both the worker owner position and the consumer owner position. So I'm sort of listening to who may be on the call of, as a consumer cooperative and you're, you have consumer owners running 
um, that uh, we we're not doing a we don't do a, a formal selection process, but we incorporate it into the whole structure of how we operate. That we encourage any potential candidate. You know, we we have a, a packet which is going to outline um, exactly what kind of care. You know, what are we looking for? That we're looking for people who are going to want to represent the whole the whole ownership and not just one particular point of view. Um, and then we encourage people to actually attend a board meeting to get familiar with the process of what's happening, and they get some orientation to policy governance ahead of time if they choose to participate in that, so they know that what they're getting into. And then they they understand that if they did run, that they would need to sign off on the board policies. In other words, own for themselves that they're agreeing with those policies and that to be on the board, they would need to sign off on that. So there is some basis that when they do become a board member and they, they then take on some kind of personal agenda, there is a control in place from the board standpoint to be able to hold them to what they signed off on. So we opted for it being incorporated in the process and culture of the board than having a specific selection process. And it's worked well so far, um, and I think you know, we realize that we take a risk for not to not have really full screening, but um, for us, we definitely wanted to, it to be open for the owners actually feeling as if they're the one having pure selection of the um, the member. And this is Leslie, and I'll, I'll just add to that, we have not, we don't have a nominating process, and we haven't really had an issue of a board member um, derailing our process. Um, we adopted policy governance before we opened, so it's pretty ingrained in our, um, our, our, you know, in the style, in our style at this point. I think, to the extent that it can be after just a few years. But I will say that this conversation that's happened lately is a realization that um, although we get excellent turnout at our annual meetings, it's still such a fraction of our membership that um, we are starting to think about how are we going to, um, you know, an open and a democratic process that's entirely transparent isn't really that if people aren't showing up to vote. And so it is something that we are actually um, trying to figure out how to address. Good. Good. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, and we'll we'll move to the next slide. Um, and just to, to specify that in this seminar, we are uh, talking about a, a screening process, um, but we are not talking about a screening process that removes the choice for who is uh, on the board from the members. It is the most important decision that members have to make is who is on the board. Uh, we're just suggesting bringing them uh, a slate of candidates um, for them to choose from all of whom would be uh, w would add a value to the board. So, Michael, are you ready to uh, take it back over? Okay, yeah. then I'm going to just keep well, going. Well, well, let me just ask Michael. Maybe he just needs to hit stars. Uh, he needs to unmute. Maybe just give him a sec. Cause okay, get going, Marilyn. Did you hear? Did you hear me that time? Nothing. Oh, now now we do. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that, Mark. Um, it is my day for technical difficulties. Okay, here I am. So um, thank you all for coming in there. Um, I do appreciate it. Um, so here we just we wanted to reaffirm what we were just hearing. Um, I was able to hear there for a few minutes. Um, the idea that, that screening is and can be an important part of the board's work, and it's not necessarily anti-democratic um, that, that co-ops often have uh, mechanisms for anybody to get onto a ballot, but the board as a leadership group really should be taking um, care to put on the ballot and to, to pull together candidates that they really believe are going to help the co-op uh, become the best it can be. Um, so on the next slide, I want to get into a little bit about how um, the board goes about doing some of the screening and the interviews that um, you were just hearing about from the interview process. There is in your tools um, a set of sample questions that you might ask. Um, we put those together just based on uh, what we've heard from folks at work. They're, they're not meant to be 
uh, the end all and be all, um, but gives you an idea of how you might start uh, either putting together a written application with questions on it or a, or a oral interview process. Remembering that the, the question and answer is a chance for the board to learn about the candidate and the candidate to learn about the board, that it should be mutually beneficial. Um, so uh, you might learn in the interview as a, as a potential candidate, you know what, I really do want to be really actively involved in operational I mean, there's another avenue for me. This is a board that doesn't do that kind of work um, on the board that I sit on. Uh, the, that happened once someone got onto the board and before too long realized that, oh, this just wasn't the work she wanted to be doing and said, you know what, I, there's something else I'd rather be doing here. And everybody was happy with it, but we thought, oh, we saved ourselves some time if we had just had a conversation ahead of time. Um, one of the things that comes out of the work of uh, Mary Corteau and Corinne Schindler um, out of the uh, governance toolbox, especially this last um, piece that sometimes people resign um, and that just drains the energy of the group. It might have been a big clash. When, as the, the story I told, it was a small issue. It wasn't really a clash, but there was a lot of energy we had put into um, bringing someone new on board that then, oh, we had to redo all that work later. Uh, so we're trying to, to say that it might be worthwhile to do a little bit of work ahead of time uh, to figure out if it's a good match. Now, the question came up earlier, and we're going to come to it now again, about the idea of nominating at all, and is this undemocratic? Uh, so on the next slide, we're talking about um, sh why should the board nominate any anyone at all? Why shouldn't we leave it just open uh, for the the vagaries, the whims of the democratic process. Um, some some folks feel like any any initiative on the part of the board is anti-democratic. Um, some feel like uh, that the board should be in total control. Uh, and what we're saying is neither one of those is quite what we're recommending. Although in some boards and nonprofits, it's very common for boards to be self-perpetuating. Uh, in our food crops, it seems like this is not. Uh, how our food crops are generally set up. Um, so the idea is that the board should be stepping forward to take a leadership role and in perpetuating the governing structure of the co-op, that's one of the things that a board leads in. Um, our co-ops are really important and governance of our co-ops is really important. I was struck recently by a, a, a quote of someone talking about Abraham Lincoln, uh, who in describing Lincoln said he always saw his role as essential but not central to the drama that was going on around him. And I really love that idea of, of our boards. We are essential, um, though there's other things that are more central for what's going on in the, in the world of our co-ops. Uh, governance is, a, is an essential thing, and the people in that governance world uh, do have a, a responsibility to make sure that we maintain that. Um, many, many members, probably most members, will be very happy to know that the folks who are in a leadership role are thinking about the future of the co-op and who might best serve in that role. And so uh, there are maybe a few who would be distraught that leaders are thinking about perpetuating leadership, but most folks will appreciate that someone is doing that work. Uh, and again, finally, the, the idea that um, a nomination from the board does not preclude or prevent, uh, unless your bylaws it does not preclude someone from petitioning to be on the ballot. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if anyone here is uh, part of um, Sierra Club. I get yearly from them their board um, election packet, and they clearly specify in their candidate statements, you know, here are the candidates that were nominated by the board, here are the, uh, the candidates who are petitioned to get onto the ballot. Both are presented side by side with no other distinction. Um, but folks, uh, you know, I look at that and I say, okay, so what do I think about these candidates? Uh, and then secondly, what do I think about whether they came on as a petition candidate or a board nominated candidate? So I think it's a, it's a fairly well established, well appreciated um, part of uh, board governing. Um, on the next uh, slide, just a little bit more specifically about nominations. Um, I was uh, talking with a group of folks on a board recently where this became an issue where a subcommittee of the board, the board uh, recruitment nomination committee, whatever they were calling themselves, um, went a little further than some folks thought they should have in deciding who was on the ballot and 
it, what became clear is that the subcommittee was actually making what should be board level decisions that who is nominated um, as a board nominated uh, candidate well that's a board decision that's not a it's not a subcommittee decision so this is a real important distinction in, in board work what do we delegate and what can we not delegate and this is a case where what we're saying is the the nominees the, the names that go on a ballot that's not delegatable to anyone else but the whole board. Um, as we're deciding who will be on the ballot, if you, uh, this is a place, um, actually I'm not sure if any of you all are participating in the uh, CGEN board list, um, but just today there was a little conversation on what makes a conflict of interest. And uh, here's one place where we're saying, well, you know, if you're up for election yourself, probably it wouldn't look good if you were the, on the committee deciding who gets their names on the ballot. So that's a place where there's a particular conflict of interest and we're suggesting that if you're up for re-election, um, you just stay out of the, those nomination decisions. Uh, and uh, a perennial question, at least on the board that I sit on, is do we want to have um, more candidates on the ballot than there are open seats? Uh, and in, um, I guess maybe even last year in the Cooperative Business Journal, there was a nice little editorial about the idea of putting more um, candidates on the ballot actually makes for more uh, democratic elections, and that, that group was really trying to encourage um, those kinds of uh, contested seats. Um, so just a little bit on elections uh, and appointments before we move on to the next part of our um, so we aren't going to spend a lot of time on this, as we said before, but this is part of uh, the idea of board perpetuation. And so we won't get a little time thinking about this later. Uh, but as a board, you could decide what it is you're trying to accomplish with elections. Um, and on one side, they're really there to make sure that your members have the chance to make an informed decision about who they want to govern their co-op on their behalf. Uh, so having good, clear communication in multiple formats is helpful. Uh, and that whatever you're doing, you want to strive for um, a democratic, accessible, and transparent process. Now, all these are really big ideas and hard to know if we're ever fully accomplishing any of those things. Um, but they're good, they're good questions to ask. You know, is, there, is there anything else we could do next time around to make this even more democratic, more accessible, more transparent? Uh, and so we've got some ideas here about the stuff to pay attention to. Um, you know, there's one board I heard of that uh, hired an accounting firm to count ballots. Well, that's one way to make sure that, that part of the job is uh, done totally um, by a third party. But you might also just say, uh, you know, a group of people who aren't actually directly up for election um, can count ballots, and that might be enough. So it's up to you all on your board and your co-op what you want to accomplish there. Um, and so uh, one more thing about an appointments. Uh, on the next slide, uh, and to think about appointments as just a special case of everything else we're, we're talking about. Um, but uh, there's really nothing very exciting, very uh, new and different about appointments. Um, the process is really the same. You will have developed your pool of candidates. So whether now you're talking about whose names go on the ballot as board nominees or who the board would appoint to fill a midterm vacancy, you're still going to the same pool, hopefully, if we've got that pool. Um, that uh, you will have a screening process, some sort of nominating process that would be internal to the board and a, and a way that the board decides, you know, makes a vote on do we appoint or not appoint this person. Um, we want to discourage um, what we've seen as a of common, but at least uh, often enough that uh, it's come to our attention, that sometimes the person, uh, or we just say, oh, who, who got the most, the, the next most votes on the last election? Well, let's just appoint them. Um, that's, that's an easy way out of making a decision, but you have to recognize that's a decision and you don't, haven't really stopped to say, what, what are the criteria by which we're choosing those, that person? Um, the members spoke in choosing who to elect, um, but the board speaks uh, in terms of choosing who to appoint, and so the board should make its own decision there. Uh, so again, we are spending a lot of time on those parts of the, the presentation today, but we just wanted you all to think a little bit about it um, as part of the whole process. Uh, and then Marilyn, I think, are you are you uh, going to present the next piece, or am I still moving on this? Oh, orientation, right? We're moving into orientation. Um, so in orientation, 
this is after you've gotten somebody either appointed or who's been elected. Um, what do we want these people to know so they can be good directors? And uh, when we ask you to think about it in terms of two levels, uh, very specific to what goes on in our co-op and our board, uh, and then more generally what happens uh, for co-op governance. Um, we've supplied a, a list of, of questions or, or uh, information that you might want to share with your new directors. Uh, and we'd like to encourage you to consider in terms of general cooperative governance, the, the CBL 101 uh, workshop and the reader that comes with it are both excellent resources. We developed those specifically to help boards orient new directors on the things that are common to all food co-op boards. Um, what is specific to your board, you know, there's no way Marilyn or I or anyone else could tell you, you know, what it is you need to know, but we've given you a, a good idea of what generally is good to explain to people. Um, the, on the next slide, just ask yourself these questions as you're developing your, your orientation materials. What do we think our new directors need to be successful? What is available? Uh, and is there a way to make this orientation one part of our continuous learning? Um, that's a very quick overview of several aspects of uh, this for perpetuation, and I want to take a minute now to see if anyone had any quick questions about that before we move on to the next uh, closing piece of the workshop. Is there anything that came up there, Mark, that you saw? Well, um, quite a few of the questions that have come in during this segment have to do with the uh, just following up on that screening, the screening process, more about uh -huh. that than the, what you've just presented. But perhaps uh, as we do a few of these screening questions, Anybody has any questions or comments on the orientation material? Uh, feel free to send those in. That's okay. fine if it's about screening. If that's the one. Okay. That folks um, so, uh, and and there might be some duplication here. So I'm just going to uh, kind of let them rip and and edit as as you need to. Um, as problematic as problematic and challenging members might be, um, how democratic or cooperative to screen and or exclude and or endorse candidates? Wouldn't it be better to train folks and let the democratic process make its way? Um, yes. I think that sounds great myself. I would be curious what, what uh, you think, Marilyn. But part of the democratic process is choosing some people whose names are on the ballot and whose mm -hmm. names get on the ballot um, would uh, still be part of that board nomination process. I think I myself think the more that the board or or whoever in the club is doing this work is training people to be good participants in governing and and thinking about democratic ownership, I think that's great. But still, out of that process, uh, some some names have to get onto the ballot, mm -hmm. and I still think it's important for the leadership of the cooperative not to just leave that to total accident or chance. And a couple questions had to do with um, if. If, uh, if what you're talking about here would still allow for a member to end up on the ballot if they weren't endorsed by the, um, by the board? I, I that one, uh, Mark. Um, we are not talking about endorsing candidates here. So I just want to clarify that. We're talking about screening the pool of candidates and giving members a broad range of candidates to choose from in the election process. So. A board may choose to endorse candidates, but that is not what we're presenting today. Um, we just have screening. And I'd like to, to refer you back to, to the slide that we looked at earlier about the characteristics of directors. So we're, we're talking about, it was on the, uh, slide number seven if you want to look at it. Those would be the, the types of characteristics that we would suggest that you would screen for. Uh, people who can communicate effectively. Uh, people who have a commitment, a dedication to the cooperative and its member owners and its mission. Um, people who uh, are honest, independent judgment, courage, and good faith. So we are definitely not talking about uh, trying to maintain the status quo or having the board of directors you know, keep from having anyone who's going to challenge their thinking. Absolutely not. We're talking about going through a process that says that all of the candidates on, uh, who are on the ballot meet the criteria that we've set, and it's the member's job to choose among those. 
So I just want to clarify that difference between um, endorsement. Um, so the, the, where in that case, the board would say, we think these are the preferred candidates. Again, your co-op may choose to do that. Our workshop today is just suggesting that you have a screening process for the characteristics that your co-op has set uh, for what you think makes for a good director. Um, and, and up on the slide are, again, some that we find to be common and useful on a board, uh, people who are able to delegate responsibility, you know, not people who have to, to make every decision themselves but can work effectively in a group. So. And Marilyn, just to be clear, what you're, but what you are suggesting is that a screening process might um, might end up with the board um, not choosing to move a candidate forward in the process to be on the ballot. Yeah, that could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the point of the screening that it, there might be you might run across a candidate here or there that does not meet the characteristics uh, uh, that you've set for effective directors. Um, and as Michael pointed out, they uh, many co-ops have the option that they could still um, place themselves on the ballot if uh, by petition. Um, so just, but the main point I wanted to, to clarify is the difference between screening and endorsement. Um, there was a, a question about how long you imagined those candidate interviews taking, and I think that might have, that was one uh, of the participants who who shared a story about interviewing the candidates and a person yeah. asked about how long that was. Yeah, Amy, could you address that? How long did you uh, spend in your interview? We spent uh, 45 minutes to an hour with each candidate. And um, and like I said, we had these really open-ended questions. So uh, to, to a great degree, they sort of determined the length of the interview. Um, some of them, it was hard to get through 10 questions in an hour. And um, while we still endorse them, we could tell that they were going to be a very strong personality on the board. And, um, and we didn't make it this time, but I think that, and, and I think that's good given the, um, the makeup of our board right now. I think he would be a good candidate if we have other strong personalities as well. So Amy, you're saying you did the interviews and all of the candidates that you interviewed, you placed on the ballot. Yes, and we actually were doing board endorsement. That's sort of as far as we could all agree on this time. Um, and I think that um, we'll probably discuss it again next time, screening versus endorsement. Um, people were concerned that uh, trying to get 25, even 50 or 50 names on a petition was going to be um, too onerous for people to want to try and do it that way. but. Um, so that, that was the decision we made this year, it seems. Um, basically, anybody could be on the ballot, but only the ones that we chose would be endorsed. But you were endorsing more candidates than there were seats available, so it was any of, the members could choose from any of these candidates? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, other questions, Mark? Uh, just uh, a comment here. Uh, from from a director uh, appreciating your distinction between screening and endorsements. We have created our cr criteria for screening, but we can't keep anyone off the board if they meet the bylaw requirements, which are quite minimal. Just a comment more than a question. Okay. And um, then let's move into, there was um, a comment here on how much, uh, quote, board meeting time should be devoted to new board member orientation, uh, i.e., how much will other um, uh, board members benefit from the review of the orientation material, team building nature of the orientation, and an, an entire meeting, or should orientation just occur during a one-on-one -on -one mentor director uh, with, with new people? Uh, maybe I could try to make a quick answer to that and then uh, leave you, Marilyn, to try to close out for us. Is that all right? Yes, that's uh, fine. One of the things we wanted to, uh, when we developed the CBL 101 program, is we were trying to offer boards a way to make sure that their new directors got oriented without that taking up an undue amount of the board time. Uh, board, board meeting time is pretty limited and pretty precious. And I think the board would have to make a decision about what is the best use of that time. 
sometimes there's a question that a new person might have or a training a new person might need uh, that would really benefit everybody on the board, and that, that might be a good thing to do when everyone's together. Uh, but we want you to, um, we want all of us to be thinking about how we make best use of the very limited amount of board time where we're all together and what's the best use of that. Uh, so I, I think that the question comes back to, to the, the whoever asked it and to all of us is make that a conscious decision every time it comes up of what is the best use of our board time. Okay, thanks, Michael. Sounds good. So the uh, we're getting ready to to wrap up here, and we'll go on to the uh, to the next slide, which is a list of some of the tools that we have available. Um, I believe it's uh, page number twenty-eight. Okay, hold on. You got a little toolbox. Uh, yes, that would be the one. Cute. So uh, since you're here, you're registered for this workshop, and that means that you can access the audio file or the the um, the slides at any time. But you can also uh, access any of these tools. We have a sample policy from a board on board perpetuation and how how they've uh, how a board has articulated its its um, broad vision about board perpetuation. We have a sample charter for, uh, uh, nominations and recruitment committee. A sample timeline. Uh, you'll notice it's an 11-month timeline with one month to celebrate. Um, so it it does lay out all of the steps that would could be involved in the process that we've been talking about. Uh, we've we've uh, given you a sample table of contents for a recruitment packet. Uh, sample questions. There's two sets of questions. One uh, from the uh, interview process, and uh, that we we used. Um, the, the flow of questions and uh, expanded that a little bit from the community mercantiles interview process and another set of questions that can be used for written responses for an application process. And then a list of materials that would be useful for directors to use uh, to use with new directors for their orientation. And then next we just wanted to uh, to say that this this is a process that can be overwhelming if at the current point you've just been uh, trying to beg people to, to be on the board if you don't have your deep and broad pool of candidates yet. Uh, so not to fret if it's not possible to do everything right away, but always begin right here where you are and work out from there. So don't worry about what you're not able to do. Just Just take one more step this year. Just begin to think about developing a pool ended it so that you have a, a good group to call on when you need new directors. Um, we did have a couple comments come in there uh, while those last two um, topics were being discussed. One, w really wishing we could hear more about board orientation process of these uh, participating co-ops you have on the line and also hearing about board um, compensation. And then, um, well, Marilyn and Michael, you think about how to respond to that. I'm going to put the slide up that shows the address uh, for where the tools are. Uh, well, we are out of time for today, so we won't be able to respond to those. But all of the co-ops are in, involved in the C-Build program, so feel free to take your, your comments and questions up with, with any of the directors, with any of the consultants that you're working with. Um, we hope that we've been able to cover the objectives that we had today to understand the importance of having a plan for board perpetuation, that you have some new ideas and resources for accomplishing your plans, uh, that you know how to develop and maintain a pool of candidates, that you know how to transition from candidates to directors and have some, some um, tools and materials to support and orient new directors. So those were our objectives, and we hope we've covered those. Um, feel free to be in contact with either Michael or I with uh, questions or with your primary C-Build consultant. And uh, with that, I'll sign off, let Michael do the same, and thank you for, for coming today. Thank you all so very much for your time and for uh, the several of you who agreed to speak on behalf of your co-op and share some stories. I hope all of us will find time and ways to share more stories with each other. 
thank you for putting up with my technical glitches, and I look forward to hearing from all of you all later on. So thanks a bunch. And, and lastly, when we end the session, there will be a survey that comes up, a session evaluation. Please, please uh, take a minute to um, put in your comments there. We take those seriously as we continue um, working with our, our, uh, our future programs. Okie doke. Bye now.